If you would like to support the channel, then please turn off adblock and refresh the page. Alternatively, use the link in the description below to donate to T1 Patreon. Thank you. Hello YouTube, I'm T1 Glistener Elf. When we think of sports, especially those that are more physically oriented, we tend to think of ones where all of the elements of the game are as equal as possible for all participants, aside from, of course, the participants themselves. For instance, in football, both teams have the same number of players, both on and off the field, and the same rules govern both of them. If one team can make a certain play, then so can the other. In chess, the board starts the same for both players, although white has a tiny advantage from going first. This is as much luck as can be removed from the game on a practical level. To some, this universality, this uniformity of rules, is a prerequisite for being a sport in the first place. However, in certain competitive games, especially esports, whether card games like Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Hearthstone, etc., or video games like League of Legends, Dota 2, Street Fighter, or my personal favorite, Super Smash Bros. Melee, players have to pick from among elements that exclude other possibilities. In trading card games, this means playing certain decks, which precludes the possibility of playing other decks. In Smash Bros., Players must select from a roster of unique characters, and so on. This option creates a metagame, an environment where there is not one best answer, but rather a rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock, of which ones beat others and are, in turn, beaten by others. On the one hand, this can give less skilled players a better chance of breaking into a game competitively while they're still developing, a handicap that makes the game more accessible, even when the learning curve is high. On the other hand, players can get paired into an unfavorable matchup for them, which can leave them feeling powerless at the mercy of fate. This is one reason why more skilled players may not feel that such games adequately allow them to express their expertise and experience. Over time, communities for these games start to see how well these elements perform in general and against others in a competitive environment. With a large enough sample size and an adequately informed discussion of why aspects of each are good and bad, these communities often end up with a tier list. So then, what exactly is a tier list? Well, for the purpose of this discussion, I define tier list as rankings of the electable elements in a game, such as character or deck selection, in order of competitive viability, assuming equal skill and variance for all who use each. Tier lists take into account several factors when ordering, such as the strengths and weaknesses of the aspects and overall strategy of an element, matchup spread, the current metagame and the element's effectiveness within that metagame, tournament results, and possibly more, especially those that are specific to certain games, such as accessibility to more sideboard options in Magic the Gathering. Of note, while tier lists assume equal skill, they also usually imply that the skill is at or near the highest humanly attainable level. It is, however, certainly possible that lower levels of skill might yield a different tier list. This factor makes more of a difference in games with low variance than when high variance is present, such as card games with randomized decks, although extremely high difficulty ceilings can make a s substantial factor out of skill, such as in the cases of Vintage Storm or Legacy High Tide to Gordian decks in Magic. Within this ranking are often classes, divisions of elements into groups that maintain the same rank order. These classes are referred to as tiers. While tiers are supposed to be drawn uh, to qualitatively distinguish elements by viability, such as for informing newer players of what strategies are and are not viable, the lines themselves are arbitrarily drawn. That is, even if an objective goal is used, such as the ones that I'll be presenting, the criteria are subjective. One could always debate if certain criteria should be included, excluded, given more or less weight, etc. Often the lines are themselves drawn by taking player opinions into account, which is especially true in games like Melee, where the 13th and, as of this recording, current tier list is merely an index taken from the rankings of top players which not only indirectly takes into account frame data, character options, etc., and might over or underweigh tournament results. As of yet, there's no official definition in any game, as far as I'm aware, for what exactly constitutes a tier. 
For whatever it's worth, consider this to be my submission. Tier 1. At a competitive level, an even or positive matchup spread, and no matches that are worse than slightly unfavorable, or a soft counter. For example, in the current modern metagame in Magic the Gathering, Jund would be a Tier 1 deck, as its large creatures, ability to interact through discard and spot removal, and ability to gain tons of value give it one of the best matchup spreads in the format right now, and even its worst matchups are not anywhere near unwinnable. It's widely agreed that the worst matchup for Jun that sees noticeable amounts of competitive play is Tron, and thanks to that deck's having been nerfed by losing Eye of Ugin, as well as new toys that Jund has received, most especially Crumble to Dust and Grim Flayer, the matchup isn't terrible anymore, though that certainly doesn't mean that it's a walk in a park either. Also, in the current Yu-Gi-Oh meta, ABCs are a tier 1 deck. While it is true that answers do exist, most often before the lock can come down, the sheer speed with which ABCs goes off and the ease with which it can find and utilize its combo pieces, even in the face of most of the common removal cards in the meta, combined with the resiliency afforded by the boss monster itself being able to halt the opponent's ability to do almost anything, make the deck a force with which to be reckoned. In Melee, Fox is considered by most competitive level players to be the best character in the game, especially on NTSC. While the high skill ceiling does mean that his glass cannon nature can outshine, no pun intended, his positive traits at lower levels of play, hence Sheik being the best character for a long time, a technical enough pilot can capitalize on his advantages to the point where he has, at worst, an approximately even match against the rest of the entire cast. Tier 2. At a competitive level, an even or positive matchup spread but some matches that are significantly unfavorable and are hard counters. For example, again in MTG, Ad Nauseam loses to Infect. Hard. As it does not interact with the small aggressive creatures that impose a lower effective life total and that fight on a harder axis to stop, since neither Angel's Grace nor Phyrexian Unlife prevent poison counters from being assigned. In turn, however, Infect, my main deck in virtually every format, loses to spot removal heavy decks, which are ubiquitous in modern where, as of this recording, the two most commonly played non-lands in the format are Lightning Bolt and Path to Exile, respectively. Burn, Zoo, and Delver can all have strongly favorable matchups against Infect, and adding more interaction to combat them can slow Infect down enough to substantially alter its positive matchups against favored decks like the aforementioned Ad Nauseam. Because of this fragility forcing it to be a glass cannon to at least some degree, Infect will, by the definition that I use, always be a tier 2 deck. Meanwhile, my main in melee, Jigglypuff, is also a tier 2 character. Despite having a generally positive matchup spread, noticeably against several top tiers, the matchup against Fox is so lopsided that it alone makes Puff Tier 2. However, at lower levels of play, Jigs can be better than Fox because of the ease with which Puff can be played versus the difficulty required to play Fox. For example, a Fox that can't consistently do a running up smash loses a valuable tool, while any Puff can do the up throw to rest combo, aka the Space Animal Slayer, aka the Hunger Strike, shoutouts to Hungrybox. Tier 3. At a competitive level, a negative matchup spread, but with matchups that are favorable. This means that those within the third tier are solely good as meta reads. As such, they can be good in certain environments. For example, every now and then a land destruction deck will show up in modern. While these can prey on control decks and certain mid-range decks, they are almost always too slow for low-to-the-ground aggro and tempo decks which can develop a board before land destruction cuts off their potential to develop further. Similarly, decks with main board Blood Moon will naturally have a poor matchup against mono red decks. However, in a meta where even the burn decks usually splash for other colors, such as Naya Burn or Zoo, Blood Moon can definitely shine. Tier 4. At a competitive level, a negative matchup spread without matches that are favorable. Elements in this tier are only able to win through lack of matchup knowledge from opponents, making hard reads, gratuitous amounts of luck, and other unreliable tactics. 
In Yu-Gi-Oh, decks that rely on mini equip cards being placed onto Maha Vilo and or Armed Samurai Ben K, despite their potential to win as early as turn one, are always, always going to be in this tier, owing to the inconsistency of reaching enough attack, the fragility of the monsters themselves, the lack of interaction with opponents, the lack of viable options in the extra deck that advance the strategy, the relative lack of archetype support, and so much more. Anything below this point is not remotely tournament viable. In my system, that is by my definition, collectively anything lower is tier 5, regardless of how close or far away from viable they are. And with that, I've given all of my criteria for what should be included in the various tiers. Just to reiterate, these definitions are wholly my own, essentially my opinions. Admittedly, I prioritize matchup spread in metagames heavily, which probably largely owes to the split in my experience between games with little luck, like Melee, and games that are largely based on luck, such as most trading card games. These are my attempts to devise as close to an objective measure for what is inherently a subjective matter, that of creating classes of individual rankings. I hope that this discussion helps you out, whether in informing what deck or character you should main, what you need to do to cover your weaknesses, or any other reason. In any case, thank you all for watching. I'm T1 Glister Elf signing off. I will see you later. Take care, and uh, I hope that you've been enjoying this background video of uh, Godzilla vs. King Kong over here. Take care. Bye-bye.